All right. Well, hey, good morning. My name is Mark. I'm the executive pastor here at the Grove, and I want to welcome you. Uh, And we've got this new series that we're kicking off today, uh, Head and Heart, where we're going to be talking about what it looks like to to know God and uh, and to to know Him intimately and to know the the things about Him, uh, you know, that engage our mind, but then also to to know Him at a heart level. And I just know that across the room, uh, different friends that I have, knowing myself a little bit, like there there are those of us who you know, we kind of tend towards knowing people, knowing things, and, and it, become, it comes a little bit easier to us to know, uh, you know, at this level. And then there are others of us that may we really engage our emotions, and, and that part of it comes a little bit easier to us. And it's hard for us to play in that other playground because we, we feel more comfortable in the one or the other. And, and there really is. I mean, there is, uh, the scriptures reveal this living, all-powerful creator, living God who invites us to, to know him. He reveals truths about him that can be known. And he also invites us into a, a relation, an intimate relationship that involves knowing, about, knowing him at a heart level. And, uh, and so what we want to do is we just want to dive a little deeper to that, into that the next few weeks and, and think about what that looks like. Some, some real things, some, some practical things. What would it mean to really pursue a relationship, a deeper relationship with this, with this God and, and Jesus Christ. And, um, you know, I was making scrambled eggs yesterday morning. I don't know if anybody else likes some scrambled eggs. I, uh, can I get a, can I get a hand raise? Yeah. I, I mean, I just love me. I always have loved scrambled eggs. I mean, a good fried egg is awesome, but, but there's something about, there's something about scrambled eggs. And, you know, when I first, when my mama start, stopped making my scrambled eggs and I started making my own scrambled eggs, uh, there's been a learning process to that. And, uh, and, you know, at first I would just, you know, crack some eggs in the skillet and, uh, and spin them around a little bit, you know? That's, what, that's my eight-year-old Jack. That's his word for, for stir. You just spin it around. Just spin it a little bit. So, I, you know, I cracked the eggs and just spin them a little bit, add some salt and pepper. That was, that was about my scrambled egg uh, experience, you know? And, and then I, I started noticing other people's scrambled eggs. Our scrambled eggs, like at a restaurant, were, were fluffy, you know, I think I even watched a Veggie Tales where they were talking about fluffy eggs, and I thought, man, my eggs are not fluffy. My my eggs are just, <clears throat> you know, dense and no, no good. So, like, how do you get the fluffy eggs? So, so then I, I I don't know how I put it together. Or Terry gave me some intel, but I, I added a little bit of milk, and I got one of those those things, those egg beater things, and uh, and like instead of stir- and uh, and like instead of stirring it in the frying pan, I just would stir it outside in a bowl and get it really frothy and all, you know. And sure enough, then it would. They would be much more uh, fluffy and, and nice. Uh, man, I can't remember which VeggieTales that was. Somebody, that's really funny. It's stuck in my head. Anyway, so then, man, these, these fancy pants brunch places out there that, you know, everybody's eating brunch these days, and, uh, and you go in there and you get some, somebody has really cooked some scrambled eggs. Uh, we've got a chef in the room who uh, actually works, works at uh, Hellfellow Wellmet down in, in Johnson, and if you have not had the scrambled eggs, uh, and the simple is one of the things on the menu, and there are these scrambled eggs in this little bowl, and they're, they're just... I mean, it's life changing. Not they're not just. It's not just scrambled eggs. It's not Crackle Barrel. It is. It is a whole. It's a whole other thing. And so, a couple of weeks ago, I was talking to him about this. Like, how do they? How do they like that? You know. And then immediately, I mean, man, he's got this whole other passion about it. He's got this whole other life study of it. He starts talking about the eggs, and there's a particular kind of egg, and there's these ingredients, but there's a particular kind of ingredient, and, and blah, 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 and I'm like, boom, immediately, I'm like, man, he's at a whole nother level. And I would love to pursue how to make a scrambled egg like that. I mean, what if I could make those eggs at home, right? But the amount of energy and effort to know how to make scrambled eggs at that level that this guy has spent his, his time and effort and energy pursuing... Man, that seems like that's way out there. I want it, but man, it's, and there's a part of me that's like, man, is it, is it uh, just staying where I am? Just being satisfied with where I am, where I'm comfortable, where it doesn't require anything else of me? I mean, my scrambled eggs are all right, right? I don't get complaints from the kids. They're not like, Dad, these scrambled eggs aren't any good. They don't know about, the, about how good the scrambled eggs could be. They're okay, so maybe, maybe I just settle. 
Makes me think about uh, if you ever get coffee at Onyx on the side of the coffee cup, it says, never settle for good enough. But we're tempted. We're, we're tempted when we think about this invitation that God has given to know him to be satisfied with what we know already, what has been given to us in the past, you know, the, the bit of study that we have done, as if some point we know all of it. But let's be honest. I don't care who you are in this room and how much you studied and how much you know about this God, you are still just dabbling in the shallow end. Your toes are just dipping in the water because this God is big and there's so much to be known about him and there's so much to know about him and you've only just played played on the surface. But a lot of times we we just settle. And I think it's largely because either we are unaware are uninspired in that pursuit, if I'm just being honest. You know, un- unaware that, that, they would, that the living God would really desire that, that he would invite us to it, to it, that he would want us to have that intimate relationship with him. I mean, would God really, the holy God, really, really want to be, want to hang out and know me and be known by me? Or uninspired. There's so many other things that have our attention and that seem like they would give greater satisfaction or, you know, and so we, we pursue other things and we're just uninspired in that pursuit. And in the next few weeks and, and today, uh, what I really hope happens and I'm praying happen is that we, uh, we become more aware of it and at a deeper level, more inspired. You know, I think uh, we tend to be satisfied with an elementary understanding and an immature relationship with God. And uh, elementary and, and immature. And I was thinking about our, our eight-year-old twins. The, uh, the other day, I, we were checking out at Walmart, and Jack's standing beside me, and, you know, I go to, to stick my credit card in there, and, and Jack says, is that thing infinite? <laughs> what, what is what infinite? He's like, is that, is that card? Is that card infinite? Oh, you mean, does this... Does this, does this card have an infinite amount of money on it? Yeah. It's like, you, you, he's watched me. I mean, I pay for things with it, you know? Is it, is it endless? Is it infinite? I was surprised that he knew the word infinite. But, <laughs> man, is it infinite? And so then we had a talk on the way home about a deeper understanding. He had an elementary understanding of how a credit card <laughs> works and how daddy's finances work. Uh, yesterday, uh, Terry and I have got a little trip that we're going on this week, and and I didn't put these two things together, but yesterday my Darcy was just, she was, you know, just always like I'd turn around and I'd bump into her because she was right by my side all day and, and she was holding on to my leg and she was, we were at the pool for a little bit and she would just not get further than two inches from me. And it, finally I was like, girl, like, just give daddy a little bit of space to breathe. You know, I, I love you, but, but man, and, and she, I said, what's, what's going on? And it, and it took a second. And I kept on asking questions, and then, and then finally she said, I mean, I know that you and Mom are going to be gone a little bit, and I, I just, I want, I want to make these moments, I want, to be, I want to be with you, I want to be as close to you as I can be. But it took a second for her to try to figure out what's going on, with, for me to even recognize what's going on with her, her emotions. And the truth is, man, y'all, like, we are not, which is not even the best of us, struggle to be in touch with our own emotions. And so we have uh, this, this limited knowledge in and, uh, and limited emotional capacity. And God is calling us in both with our, with our minds and with our hearts to know him. You know, a few weeks ago, we were, we were looking at the Upper Room Discourse, John chapter 13 to 17. And there were a lot of incredible things there. And we called this out there, but kind of our core verse for these next few weeks together, we're, we're taking from that because we wanted to dive a little bit deeper into this. And if you'll remember, it's in John chapter 17, Jesus is with his disciples and he, and he says this prayer. And here's what he says. He says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life. This is Jesus giving the definition of eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That's Jesus' definition, knowing God. 
This tells us that knowing God intimately is the essence of living, of being in, in this life and in the next. Knowing God. Which if I go back to the, you know, what we've known and what we begin to know and, and pursue God to know him more deeply, this is a huge thing to me. When I saw this verse, it blew me away because honestly, I mean, growing up around church and, and hearing people teach the Bible and trying to study it a little bit on my own, the minute I would hear somebody say eternal life, I immediately thought, man, streets of gold and, you know, the place, heaven, heaven the place, eternal life, the place. And so for Jesus to say, no, eternal life is, is this pursuit of uh, the ability to know me and knowing me, doing that, that's, that's eternal life. Let me ask you, is that, is that idea, uh, it, it being a, a knowing a person instead of this, this place out there, is that scary or inspiring to you? Because interpersonal relationships are difficult, right? And, uh, and I am not by nature an extrovert. So when we walk into a room and there's a bunch of people, I absolutely despise surface level conversations. And so I don't like those settings. I'm, I'm the one that kind of backs into the, cor- backs into the corner. and Because I, I don't, I don't want to just talk about this and that and get all the facts about somebody. Man, I, I, I really do. My d- desire is to get to our hearts. So a lot of times on a Sunday... Man, instead of having 400 conversations, I might have two or three really deep ones. That's where, that's where I'm comfortable. And so I remember uh, Terry and I going to uh, these friends, invited us to a birthday party, and we knew when we were going that we were going to be the only, that they were going to be the only couple that we knew there. And I was already all that day nervous about it. And, uh, and we showed up, and sure enough, I didn't know anybody in the room except that one couple. And it was so awkward and so weird, and I couldn't wait to get out of the room. And I was really tired, and I didn't want to talk about, hey, what do you do, what do you do, where are you from, where are you from? And then and all these people that I'm not going to follow up with anyway. I was just like, What's, this is a waste of time, and I'm tired, and I don't want to do this. And I wanted, you know, Terry was talking to people, and I was like, come on, hey, you know, let's, let's roll this thing out of here. And, uh, and then some guy comes up and starts talking to me. All right, well, I'm going to be nice. I'm not going to be the mean guy. So I, we're talking, and then I get to know him a little bit deeper, and then he introduces me to this other guy, and, you know, bottom boom, it's, it's 3 a.m., and we're walking home in the neighborhood. <laughs> and there were four or five guys that I met that night that I was like, man, like, like I, it, it, this, was, this was inspiring. This was encouraging. This, like, I'm glad I met that person, and I know who they are, and it, and it matters. A few things that were said were really critical to me at that moment, that, and God really used them, and I realized that I almost missed it because I didn't want to step out of my comfort zone. I just wanted to stay in, in my box. Uh, same, similar thing happened. I've got, a, I've got a buddy that's on the exact opposite side of the planet named Vikash, that uh, you would think from our backgrounds and upbringing that we have nothing in common. And I thought that we had very little in common until I spent 12 hours in a car with him. And by the time the 12 hours was up in that car, I was like, man, basically me and this dude are the same guy. <laughs> I mean, we got very different stories or very different upbringings and influences, but the way that Jesus has revealed and drawn us to himself and our stories and interactions with, with Jesus, man, it's, it's like, man, this is my brother. This is my brother. And it, and it, and it meant spending time together. And God is calling us into that. And it's not, it's not that it's just a, a comfortable, easy place. It means that we're willing to, to go that next step. Instead of just having the scrambled eggs, that you just crack some eggs and throw it in the skillet. <laughs> it's all of that prep work, and it's all of that time getting to know things about it, and also know things about it. And now knowing me, I, <clears throat> some of you guys that know me well know this. Others may not, but I've got a little bit of a sweat problem. My pores are, are basically like a fire hydrant. Yeah. Uh, in particular, if, if we're having a spicy meal together, I, I have this major problem that I absolutely love spicy food. But when I eat spicy food, uh, this just releases the waterfall from my, from my bald head. And so it has produced some really, really awkward situations. Uh, I had one last week where I was trying to have a real intense conversation, but... Man, that, uh, that pepper hit just right, 
and it just looked like I had just gotten run, through running a marathon, you know? And that's, it's just hard. I can, I can only imagine what I look like to the other person when it's rolling down my face and I'm swapping my head with, with napkins and I'm trying to listen really intently. But it, so I had some, some conversations on the front end. I know I just can't eat spicy food, even though I would have preferred it. Another issue is I don't sweat so much here, here, but right in here, from the time I was in junior high, I've, I've had that, you know, I just, I just, I just sweat. And, uh, and so you can imagine, I got made fun of a lot as a kid. Uh, even if I didn't get made fun of, I was real awkward because I knew that, that that was there. And so I had to be real careful in my wardrobe. I mean, man, there's just a whole, you know, decade of my life that I only had black shirts <laughs> and a few, other, a few other colors, but I had to test the shirt first to see how bad will this shirt reveal my pitting problem, you know? <laughs> Am I going to be outed because they want to walk up? Or, or especially when you step up in front of a bunch of people and then it's like, man, one, you, know, you do this one time, and everybody's like, oh my goodness. You see everybody's eyes go to your underarm. Anyway, <laughs> uh, tried a lot of fixes for this, you know? Uh, originally, how many t-shirts, how many undershirts could I wear to, to, you know, delay the inevitable before it, you know, one shirt, two shirts, three shirts? Uh, they got some medicine that you can do. I don't know if anybody's, anybody's got the same problem, but anyway, there's this stuff you can, you can put on your underarms, but it's basically battery acid. It just burns the pores and, uh, and it closes them up where you don't sweat under your arms and it actually works. Only problem is the sweat just goes on down your body, and then it, my hands started to sweat like crazy. <laughs> like, well, this is not a good option. <laughs> I actually prefer the underarm sweat. Uh, and then one day, I had almost just given up. Like, man, I'm just going to accept that I only have black shirts, and I'm, I'm just, this is just all it's going to be, and I, it's going to just have to be what it is. And then one day I thought, you know what? What if? It'd be so smart if somebody made a T-shirt that uh, was just one T-shirt, but it just had, you know, a little extra padding under the arms so it would, you know, do the same thing but prevent it, you know? Surely, surely they could do it. And you know what? I looked it up, and they did. I'm helping somebody right now. I'm saving your life. And I, and I got one of these shirts, and it worked. And then I was like, hey, you know what? I'm going to wear me a pink shirt. That's right. They're going to buy me a pink shirt because I can. Because you know what? I don't have this problem anymore. And I could have just settled and stayed with my limited exposure. And, but it took a little effort, and it took a little energy. But there was a whole other world that was uncovered. God is inviting us into something deeper, but we just stop. We just give up and settle for what we've always known. I remember, and I've been really convicted thinking about this this week, that I remember when I started to get real excited about knowing Jesus more. Um, one, it was, it was the semester after Terry and I got married, uh, my junior year of college. And my whole life, I had heard people talk about the book of Acts in the early church and what happened in uh, that history and those stories and like, what does that mean for us? What does it mean then? What does it mean for us today? And there was all of this debate. And so I had good friends and people on this side of the debate and I had good friends and people on this side of the debate and I really didn't know what I thought about it. And I just decided, you know what? I am going to study the book of Acts and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask God to reveal it to me. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to dig in as deep as I can possibly dig. So it was Thanksgiving, and I told it Thanksgiving break, and we were going back home. And I, I told Terry and my family, you know what? Uh, I'm going to lock myself in the upper room in our house, and y'all can just drop food under the door. <laughs> I'm going to study the book of Acts. That's what I'm going to do over Thanksgiving break. I'm going to study the book of Acts. And I did. And they pushed food under the door, and I missed some, some family time, and I missed some other things. But y'all, I studied the book of Acts. And still today... The things that were revealed to me and that I studied during that time, the things I got mental understanding of and heart understanding of, have changed it for me. Still today. I was thinking about that with, uh, with my emotions, that during those days, I, I would just want to go solo hike just so me and Jesus could hang out. And I could talk at the top of my lungs and nobody would laugh at me. And I could be silent and listen and let, let him speak and try to hear his voice. And it was really, really, really sweet time. And I was convicted this week thinking about, man, why, why do I feel like I got to some point where I don't need to go back and study Acts again because I've already done that. And so you can close that chapter. And like as if, as if there's, there's less of God to know. Actually, each new door you open, there's more to know because he's that big. And he's inviting us into that deeper relationship. You know, Paul talks about this in Philippians chapter 3. 
He's talking about these different uh, things that he's accomplished and you know, accolades that he has and, uh, in his life. But then he says, indeed, I count, I count everything a loss compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, as trash, in order that I might gain Christ. You see that the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus our Lord. That if we, if we put that on a scale with everything else we got going on, the worth of knowing Christ Jesus our Lord is, is, is the thing. It's, it's of more worth than any other thing. You know, last week, I, if you were here, I asked you the question, you know, if all of your highest goals and ambitions, would they be fulfilled or destroyed in, in the return of Jesus? Are they, are they your goals and, and ambitions and dreams? Or are they a part of his goals and ambitions and dreams? Because one, it, it has a, an end date. The other, the other doesn't. In the same way with this, man, of all the things, this is worth more. They, in comparison, they are trash compared to the weight and the worth and the invitation to know Jesus. That's huge. Uh, I got to go on a trip to Burundi, Burundi, East Africa, a few years ago to source some coffee. And, uh, you know, I'm used to exchange rates, you know, that you're in one place, the the, the dollar's worth this much, and you're in another place, the dollar's worth this much, and how to, I'm not great at math, but I can can figure out a system to do a little quick math in my head and figure that out. But in Burundi, y'all, it's 2,000 to 1. And I'm telling you, that's really difficult when you're talking 2001. Because real quick, you're dealing with 10,000 note bills and you're, you're trying to change money. And the farmers that we were working with, they said, I know this is going to seem shady, but you just need to give us all your, all your American cash and we're going to change it into Burundi francs and, and we're just going to do all the dealing with it because it's going to be too confusing for you. And real quick, we, we, uh, our luggage didn't make it and we had to go into the local market and buy some jeans, which all they had was bedazzled jeans. And really, really, because uh, we were really big guys in Burundi, and they were skin tight, bedazzled jeans, and we were hiking in the mountains. And I'm glad there's no photos of this, because it was really, really bad. But anyway, uh, but he, we're dealing with these jeans, and they're dealing, and they're throwing down bills, and you know, there's some bargaining going back and forth, and bills are flying everywhere. And I just realized real quick, I don't have a clue. But the thing I didn't understand that they were right about is I didn't know how to value the Burundi franc. I, I was unable to do it. And, you know, I, I think that even the, maybe the, those of us that have been church the most devalue how incredibly big it is that because of what Jesus did on the cross and brought, coming back from the dead, he made it possible for us to be in a relationship with the creator God. And he invites us to do that today and for eternity. <laughs> what an invitation of all things Nothing is worth more. No higher pursuit today. No better way to spend time. It, it's, it is. And he invites us into it. You know, I think it's interesting too because a little bit further in uh, Philippians chapter 3, when he, when he talks about what it looks like to know him, he says, sharing in his sufferings. He wants to, he wants to know him to that degree. He wants to share in the sufferings of Jesus so he can know not just the things about Jesus, but to know Jesus that deeply, to share in the sufferings that Jesus encountered and and endured. Not just a classroom knowledge, but but knowing him in that experiential way. Things you just can't learn just just studying or being here on Sundays. Uh, A couple weeks ago, I had a buddy that said his, his daughter wanted to be a commercial pilot and so he sent me this list of all these, these flight schools and asked me if I could somehow help him find out which one of those would be the best one for his daughter to go to. And so I've got a friend who's a commercial pilot. So I took it, I laid all these schools out and I said, man, what, what advice would you give him? And he looked at all of them and he said, you know, I don't know one of those names, but it doesn't really matter. They're probably all great. He said, there's just one question to ask. Which one of those, oppor- which one of those options is going to get her uh, flying a plane in the air the most. Get her flight hours the quickest and the most. Because she can learn all the other things, 
But the thing that really matters is that she's in that cockpit, flying that plane, dealing with those instruments in the air, not a flight simulator, not a whatever, but actually flying the plane, experiential. And I thought about it, and I'm like, you know what? I'm glad that's it, <laughs> because, because the pilot flying the plane I'm riding on, man, I don't want it to be just that he knows what the book has to say about it. The same way with the doctor, right? I don't, I don't want them just to know that. I want, them, I want them to have done this a lot of times and know, know it. Uh, it happened to me last week. I was, I was you know, we've, we've had two teenagers that we've had to teach how to drive a car, which is a nerve-wracking experience. No matter how good they are, no matter how good a teacher you are, no matter how good your relationship is, it's, it's, just, it's just tough. And uh, I'm grabbing hold of the handle. And wait, man, if we just had like those teacher ed, you know, where they've got the brake on this side and the extra drive, that would be really, really helpful. But you don't. And so you're just trying to deal with it. And, uh, and you know what? You can teach. Here's where the instruments are. And you push that button and it makes the windshield wipers come on. And you do this and it, whatever. And uh, you can teach how all the instruments work. But that, that deeper uh, that deeper thing of knowing how to anticipate the next move of another driver. You know, if you've been driving for a while, you know what I'm talking about. You, you see somebody and you know a tendency of what they do and you know how to respond. So I was driving his car last week and, and I just looked down off the road for a second. I thought that there was a crack in the window and I just went from here to here. And when I looked back up, the car in front of me had slammed on its brakes uh, out on 112. And, uh, and the, the car started, I slammed on my brakes and the car started to slide. And we, I probably slid 25 feet something. And, uh, and it started to fishtail. And I just naturally corrected, you know, as it was fishtailing and stayed in my lane. And when I stopped, you know, major accident that didn't happen. But I thought, but if this had been him driving, as a new driver without any experience, I mean, I could tell him all, but he hasn't experienced something like that. He would have veered over in the other lane and maybe caught head on traffic. There's something about engaging in it, not just knowing things, but experientially and with your heart. You know, in Matthew chapter 22, there are these religious leaders that are, that are firing these riddles at Jesus, trying to knock him off base. One of the, one of the guys asked him this question about the resurrection, this riddle. And, uh, and Jesus responds, and I just think this is interesting. He says, you are wrong because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. Which I think really points to this. There's a degree to which we know the scriptures. And there's another degree to which we know and have experienced the power of God. And uh, so the, he goes on. There's a, another lawyer that comes up and, uh, and asks him about the greatest commandment. What is the greatest commandment? And Jesus answers it this way in verse 37. And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first, uh, the great and first commandment. All your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all, 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 all in, all in. Not just a little bit, not just one aspect, all, all in. Some of those things are comfortable. Some of those things are not comfortable. But total immersion in knowing him. And uh, I thought about this. You know, this is a time a lot of folks are traveling. And when you go to a, to a new place, you have a decision to make. And I've noticed I've been in some of these conversations lately where, where people kind of fall in different, uh, different feelings about this. You know, you go to a new place and it's a beautiful place. And uh, some folks want to just go to that place and enjoy the beauty but not really engage the people or the culture or anything like that. You know, think about uh, maybe going to some all-inclusive gated resort in a foreign country and, you know, you get off the airplane, you go there, you go through the gate, you go in. And really inside of there, there's a lot of people from your place. <laughs> if you've ever done this, like you show up, you're like, oh, this is from Arkansas, I guess, from Texas. I guess, you know. And you never really interact or leave the compound. This is, this is just, you're enjoying that place, and the, but but you're, you're still very much in your comfort zone. And then some people want to do that, but then they want to add to that maybe the excursion where they kind of just step out a little bit and go do something fun, limited, uh, very protected, very under control, very catered to the likes and dislikes of, you know, the people who normally come to this kind of place. 
And then there's the people, man, that, that want to go and they don't want to stay at that place. They want to stay in the local hotel and eat the local food and get to know the kind of got to get to know the locals and taste something that they've never tasted before and try to speak in another language a little bit and, and do things a little bit different. Maybe interact with some of the, the local folks, you know, but then there's next level. There's the people who do a homestay in a local family's house and only eat home food and put themselves in a spot where nobody's speaking English, everybody's speaking another language, and they're way outside of their comfort zone. And I think that that's what Jesus is calling us to, to immerse and know him in that way. But we're tempted for the time, the effort, the energy, maybe the awkwardness to go to that place, just, just to settle for this. Now, I don't know if y'all knew this, but uh, our worship pastor, Cass, uh, knows a little bit about music. That, now, let me say, not, not just how to play the music, but I'm telling y'all, y'all talk to Cass for a minute, and you find out, man, he, he just knows a lot about music, right? And so when we moved here and I got to get to know Cass, you know, I, I fancy myself somebody who knows a little bit about music, you know? But I would routinely say something, and he'd just look at me like, what are you talking about? That didn't make any sense. And uh, one time, for instance, I, I said something, made a comment about a song, and, and I said that it was Leonard Skinner, and he looked at me and said, that's actually a Queen song. And I felt really dumb. <laughs> All right. You know what? I just, I'm going to stop. And for a while, I was just like, man, I'm, not gonna, I'm just not going to bring anything up because I just reveal I just reveal my lack of knowledge. And, uh, and, and he's really smarter than I am and knows stuff that I don't know and band names and things. And, um, but a few weeks ago, we were in the car for a little bit together. And uh, we got to talking and we got to talking about some, some songs that he's writing. And I started to ask questions about and what it looked like to be to write a song, and he started teaching me about how different, uh, you know, different songwriters how they how they work, and in particular for him what he does and, and how it works and this creative process and all these things. And I'm just sitting here looking at this friend of mine and the passion in his eyes and the in particular things about how his makeup and, and, and the energy and the way that he works to accomplish this thing, and and I was just amazed. And I got out of the car feeling like I knew my friend Cass at a level that I'd never known him before. You know, that's, that's what Jesus invites us into. It, it, through the awkwardness, through the, the energy, through all, he invites us into this relationship. And I'm just amazed that he would give us the invite, <laughs> that he would reveal himself, that he would make it possible for us to be there. And so our hope over these next few weeks is that you would be inspired and accept this challenge to know him, not just, not just the things about him, not just with your heart, but <laughs> with all your heart, soul, and mind, and strength. Let me pray that that would be true. Father, we, we do. We, uh, we accept the invitation and confess that there's a lot of things that distract us, we get knocked off, uh, off base sometimes and, and give other things more worth than, than we give to this incredible opportunity and invitation. We, uh, we stop short and settle. Father, I'm, I'm asking you that you would just draw us in that these, these Sundays as we're talking about it, that, that during the week as we, as we think about it, that you would draw us in. Father, we love you so much. We want to know you. Amen.